Let's go. It's a beautiful morning, guys, and we're on our way to the National Museum of African American History and Culture. And uh, I'm excited about this. I've been planning this trip, believe it or not, since the summer of 2020. But for obvious reasons, I did not um, follow through with those plans to go. But today is the day we're going, and it's going to be, I believe, my third or fourth visit. I think it's going to be my fourth visit to the museum and it is so huge that is the largest museum i think i've ever been to with maybe seven or eight floors i've never been able to see the entire museum in one visit just haven't been able to do it it's too massive so i'm gonna do my best i already know this video is gonna probably be in parts um i'm gonna try and keep it to maybe three or four parts and uh that way you'll be able to see everything so let's go Okay guys, we're just about a block away from the museum. I had to park my car and then walk roughly <laughs> about a mile. So we're on our way and uh, we're making good progress. There's a lot of school buses out here today. And I think that means, you know, the class trips, school trips. So we'll be there in just a little bit. I'm gonna put my glasses back on, it is bright but we're almost there. I'll tell you guys, one thing to keep in mind when you come visit the city, have on really good walking shoes. You get a workout, <laughs> no doubt about that. And there it is, guys, the brown building right there. We're just about there.
slavery, also considered New World slavery, exploited human lives to build wealth and power for nation states, colonies, institutions, and individuals. It also commercialized and racialized slavery. Between 1501 and 1866, at least 12,500,000 enslaved Africans were shipped to the Americas. Close to 400,000 of them were brought to North America. Europeans built an economy based on slavery and the New World plantation system. To make vast profits from the global demand for sugar, rice, tobacco, and coffee, they invested in slave labor to clear land, grow crops, and to provide a luxurious lifestyle, regardless of the moral issue of enslaving another human. Olada Equiano was kidnapped and enslaved at age 11 and taken to the Caribbean and the Americas. Equiano endured the horrific experience of New World enslavement. In his autobiography, he recalled, in a little time after, amongst the poor chained men, I found some of my own nation, which in a small degree gave ease to my mind. The church, governments, and companies invested in the business of slavery. The sale of enslaved Africans and the profits made from their labor developed European nations and New World colonies. Men such as Henry Lawrence, a partner in one of the largest slave trading houses in colonial North America, transformed their profits into position and power. Lawrence sold thousands of enslaved Africans in the 1750s. He gained influence as one of the wealthiest colonists and later became a prominent member of the Continental Congress. The wealth generated by slavery was enormous for nations as well. By 1833, when Great Britain abolished slavery, the country paid out roughly $2.4 billion in today's currency to compensate British slave owners. The transatlantic slave trade was built on profit and human suffering. Despite the harsh reality of the inhumanity of enslavement, enslaved people forcibly dispersed throughout the Atlantic world created something more, new connections, new cultures, and a rich African diaspora. and varying systems of slavery. From rocky coastlines to dense swamplands, massive forests, and expansive coastal plains, enslaved Africans learned the terrain. They cleared and cultivated the land, building profitable plantations in port cities. Forced together, Africans, including the Akans, Igbos, Mende, and Bambara, contributed to the new regional cultures throughout colonial North America. While all the colonies held enslaved people, the systems of slavery varied. In most instances, the condition of slavery was not yet defined. In some instances, a few Africans in America had limited degrees of freedom. On large plantations, enslaved people made up a black majority. 
This enabled them to maintain cultural practices and create new American cultures. In large port cities like Charleston, New Amsterdam, and Philadelphia, enslaved men, women, and children often worked in a variety of trades as domestics, craftsmen, dock workers, and local vendors. In bustling cities, free and enslaved Africans had more opportunities to meet, build relationships, and share information. On small, rural farms, enslaved people often formed close relationships with American Indians and European indentured servants. They labored, lived, and rebelled together. The dependency on slave labor spread across North America, from Dutch New Amsterdam to the British colonies, as well as in French Louisiana and Spanish Florida. With the reliance on enslaved populations, new laws defined who was enslaved and who was free. By 1750, the system of slavery was racialized and had become more uniform. The law based slavery on African descent and made it hereditary and lifelong. This separated indentured Europeans and enslaved Africans. It created whiteness, and Africans became black in colonial North America. The race-based system of slavery was cemented into law. It was fundamental to the growing colonial economy and would prove instrumental to the founding of the United States. From the earliest forced arrival in colonial North America, enslaved Africans had rebelled. They watched with personal interest as mounting tensions between British troops and local seamen exploded onto the streets of Boston in 1770. At the helm was Crispus Attucks, a 47-year-old sailor and fugitive slave. He became the first casualty in the Boston Massacre, and his act of defiance marked the beginning of the March Toward Revolution. By April 1775, Massachusetts militiamen clashed with British troops launching the Revolutionary War. The conflict touched everyone, white, black, enslaved, or free. With much of colonial society built on human bondage, some felt that there was a paradox at the heart of the American Revolution. Abigail Adams, a white patriot, wrote, it always appeared a most iniquitous scheme to me, fight ourselves for what we are daily robbing and plundering from those who have as good a right to freedom as we have. For Africans, the revolution was a battle for freedom from slavery. As 20% of the population, Africans could tip the scales of war and therefore could not be ignored. The British and colonial armies, though initially reluctant, 
sought the advantage of recruiting able-bodied enslaved Africans to support their cause. Africans aligned with whichever side offered the better promise of freedom. The British acted first. On behalf of the British government, Lord Dunmore of Virginia proclaimed a promise of freedom to all enslaved Africans who crossed into British lines to serve as loyalist soldiers. Boston King, a black loyalist, recalled, they received me readily and I began to feel the happiness of liberty of which I knew nothing before. Later, General George Washington, low on manpower, enlisted blacks to fight for the Patriots. Black Patriot Boyro Branch remembered, thus was I a slave for five years fighting for liberty. Whether in segregated or integrated regiments, black soldiers served in pivotal battles. On both sides, they faced danger on the battlefield, including Lexington, Cowpens, Yorktown, and Bunker Hill. James Armstead, an enslaved man and Patriot spy, leaked misinformation to the British, risking his life so that America could clinch a victory at Yorktown and secure a British surrender. American independence brought liberty for some, but not all. Africans who had fought for the British fled to Canada, where they gained freedom, but faced racism. Frustrated, Thomas Peters of the Black Pioneers Regiment petitioned for better conditions and even secured immigration from Nova Scotia to Sierra Leone for hundreds of black loyalists. Africans who served as American patriots found freedom restricted and even revoked after the war. As the new nation continued to wrestle with slavery and freedom, African Americans inspired others throughout the Atlantic world to continue the fight for freedom.
Of the nearly one million African Americans forced south in the domestic slave trade, roughly 600,000 were sold on the auction block. Their labor created an empire of cotton that would transform the new nation into an economic world leader. The domestic slave trade caused immense suffering to African Americans, their families, and their communities. The desire for power and profit exacted a human cost. Eli Whitney's cotton gin, patented in 1793, helped spark this transformation by making cotton more commercially viable and increasing cotton production. With the Louisiana Purchase of 1803, the United States almost doubled in size. Cotton production and the enslaved population expanded into the Deep South. Increased revenue was not limited to the South. Cotton was marketed to northern and international textile mills, generating tremendous profit. Just as the demand for cotton spiked, the United States ended its official participation in the transatlantic slave trade, cutting off the supply of enslaved people shipped in from Africa and the Caribbean. This directly threatened the burgeoning cotton economy. U.S. slave owners were unwilling to end slavery. They turned inward and began to breed a new generation of slaves. They broke up families and communities in order to expand production. This forced migration of African Americans shifted demographics and political power to the South. The three-fifths compromise of the United States Constitution counted slaves as three-fifths of a person, giving Southern states a third more seats in Congress and allowing slaveholders' interests to dominate government. The nation's economic development was based on millions of enslaved African-American men, women, and children, and profit generated from the sale of their bodies and their labor. Known as the business, the trade profited not only the slave traders, but also many other businesses, both north and south, including broadside printers, suppliers of clothing and restraint devices, and corporations that provided financing and insurance on enslaved African Americans. Everyone was touched by slavery. During the 1830s, Isaac Franklin and John Armfield amassed enormous fortunes as owners of one of the most successful slave trading companies in the nation. They sold over a thousand slaves a year, earning more than $100,000 in profits annually, close to $62 million in today's currency. Publicly inspected and sold to the highest bidder, African Americans suffered humiliation and heartache. In 1820, 40% of enslaved people sold at auction were between the ages of 14 and 25. 28% were under the age of 13. Many were taken from loved ones, never to be seen again. Henry Bibb, born a slave in Kentucky, and his six siblings were sold to different buyers. Bibb attempted escape several times before he finally succeeded. By 1850, the Fugitive Slave Act required all Americans to return escaped slaves to slave owners. The national investment in slavery grew stronger as millions of lives continued to be torn apart by the domestic slave trade. And mothers stood with streaming eyes and saw their dearest children sold. Unheeded rose their bitter crowds while tyrants bartered them for gold.
They turned the war over the Union into a fight for freedom, resulting in the emancipation of four million enslaved African Americans. Yet at the outset of war, few could have imagined this outcome. The South fought to expand slavery without government interference. The North fought to preserve the Union, leaving slavery and its profits intact. Abraham Lincoln, at his first inaugural address, emphasized, I have no purpose, directly or indirectly, to interfere with the institution of slavery in the states where it exists. But African Americans were resolved to end slavery once and for all. Frederick Douglass wrote in 1861, let the slaves and free colored people be called into service and formed into a liberating army to march into the South and raise the banner of emancipation. In fact, African Americans had already begun to act. Three enslaved men, Shepard Mallory, Frank Baker, and James Townsend, crossed Union lines and entered Fort Monroe. They declared themselves free. Tens of thousands followed suit. Each time the United States Army advanced, enslaved African Americans ran towards freedom within Union lines. <coughs> Union General John Eaton recalled, imagine an army of slaves and fugitives pushing its way irresistibly toward an army of fighting men. Their arrival among us was like the oncoming of cities. Unwilling to violate slaveholders' property rights, the United States hesitated. Instead of emancipating the fugitives from slavery, the government declared African Americans contraband of war, enemy property, and put them to work for the Union Army. President Lincoln witnessed this mass movement as he rode through the city of Washington each day. The actions of African Americans helped convince him to issue the Emancipation Proclamation on January 1st, 1863, in order that freed those living in Confederate states. The Civil War became a battle for freedom. The United States military opened up its ranks to African American soldiers who became, in essence, a liberating army. Wearing the uniform of the United States, black soldiers consciously built a foundation for citizenship and voting rights, long denied to African Americans North and South. Almost 180,000 black soldiers served in the most brutal battles of the war. They risked their lives, even though they faced harsh discrimination. Susie King Taylor, a Union nurse, remembered. The first colored troops did not receive any pay. Finally, the government decided to give them half pay, but the men would not accept this. They wanted full pay or nothing. Joining the fight for freedom, women and children built schools, nursed the sick and wounded, and provided food and shelter extending the groundwork for a free society. Through their strength and resilience, African-American men, women, and children changed the tide of the war. Through their words and actions, they changed the course of our nation.
Tickets, please. Tickets, ma'am. Thank you kindly. Ladies and gentlemen, tickets. Hey guys, I really hope you all enjoyed the National uh, Museum of African American History and Culture. I am just now leaving. We were in there for four hours. You all could probably tell I was not even able to get up to the first floor. Um, all the time, all of that time I spent in the museum, we were down uh, below the concourse level and so you go to concourse and then you go down i want to say maybe four levels and the african-american history that starts with slavery down there and even though this is my my fourth visit this is the very first time i've ever taken my time to really absorb um the exhibits down there usually at least the last three times I just kind of I walked through I didn't focus on too much because you know I mean it's not comfortable it's not comfortable for me and it's yeah it's a part of history I'd rather 
not focus on, but it is very much a part of black history and white history. I know it's only taught as black history, but it is American history. Yeah, it's all of our history. So there's the monument back there. I don't know if I can, yep, can pick up on it. I'm on the National Mall and I have about another, I'm gonna say maybe 15 minute walk or so to get back to my car and I'm going to quickly start editing. I have a number of videos lined up for you guys and I'm going to share a little bit more about that later or by the time you see this I will have already shared my intentions for these videos that I'm storing up for you guys. So anyway, I'm going to put the camera down. I think I have like 5% battery left. <laughs> um, I got a lot of a lot of video, a lot of footage of the things that I saw there, and uh, I really hope you enjoy. So this was part one. I don't know how many parts it's gonna take for me to get through that museum, but um, I had to go online and register and, uh, and get a ticket in order to visit. And so I'm gonna probably go home tonight and try to register for my next visit and see how far I get. I'm not even gonna <laughs> state at the beginning of the next video. But anyway, if you are thinking about coming to DC, be sure, be sure um, that if you're planning to view some of the museums, you must go on the Smithsonian website. You must make reservations for certain ones. Not all of the museums require this, but a good many of them do now. And so I don't want you guys to fly here or drive here or take the train or however you get here and then try to you know get into a museum and find out that you actually can't do it because you don't have a ticket now tickets are free but i think this is just their way of getting a count of the number of visitors and tracking that kind of thing there is no charge for smithsonian museums there are some here who do charge and those are not smithsonian all Smithsonian museums are free so anyway if you can tell I am whipped <laughs> I am worn out so I'm gonna finish my matcha boba tea and just stroll it's uh after four o'clock so I need to just get ready for rush hour <laughs> traffic to get home but what I'll do guys I'll catch you in the next video take care have a great one